Where do I begin? I've been a film ge geek since I was a kid, thanks to my mom, who is also a film geek. But I often feel completely <sighs> unqualified when it comes to talking about the true classics. I had to look at Godfather. I had to look at The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And I have to look at 2001 Space Odyssey. And I look at this like, God, what do you want me to say? I mean, I could just picture an actual film geek, someone who's really into cinema, cinematics history, and looking at this and like, who's this noob who has no idea what he's talking about? And why does he have this weird background? Actually, I have much weirder backgrounds than this. And I was going through a few, and I'd selected one I thought would be good for this, and then I realized that it kind of looked weird, and this is probably going to be kind of long, and I didn't want something that was actually abrasive. So we settled on something a little bit more mild. Sorry. This, uh, this film is very, 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 very slow. I didn't say it was boring, but I did say it was slow. Everything is given tremendous amounts of time to allow it to be introduced, established, appreciated, and then moves on to the next point, which then takes time doing it. And there's a sort of a beat to things. There's only a couple of moments, I would say, that actually stuck out as legitimately boring, and it's probably no surprise that most of those had to do with the HAL section. I have a couple other things I want to say, but let's just say, yes, uh, well, this movie was deliberately designed to have more questions than answers, and certainly had a bit of a mixed reception when it was first released, even though now it is considered you know, such a landmark film. I mean, 1968, for God's sakes, and this did kind of move forward cinematography in substantial ways. I would also say that this film is a huge proponent, an innovator, if not codifier, of a lot of actual filming techniques, the literal practical matter of making science fiction films. Because these techniques, these effects, are surprisingly good now, in 2020. I actually still can appreciate a lot of the visual effects of this film. There are some specific cases where it shows, of course, but very careful and very precise usage of the effects, as well as being Stanley Kubrick and going completely overboard with it, allows them to get away with a lot of things that wouldn't otherwise work. A couple of my favorites, just really quick here. The pen off of the glass, the pen that's floating in the uh, airplane early on, that's awesome. I love how they actually had the fully circular stage that was designed to rotate so they could film him jogging on the inside of it. Just, oh my god. And I also have to admit that a lot of the sequences where Bowman goes to rescue, I can't remember his name, um, was good stuff. I liked all of that as well. So, I have a note here that says, Slow build the movie. <laughs> that was one of the first things I wrote down in my notes. Man, if only I knew. But it was also interesting, as I mentioned, this film is ahead of its time in many different ways, but the fact that they don't do the credits at the intro is very unusual for this point in history. Obviously, by the, you know, by the 90s, that now became the norm. Nowadays, it's actually really unusual if credits happen before the film actually starts. But if you remember, and I can attest to this having recently gone through the Dollar Trilogy, uh, yeah, no, the, the film credits at the beginning was pretty much the standard, even if there was something happening on camera during the events. So we just get to see the events happen. Now, one of the things that Kubrick was really big on was trying to show, not tell. I have heard arguments that he is one of the first directors to really push that ideology into filmmaking. I don't know if I'd buy that. He might have helped popularize it, and he certainly served as a landmark for several people coming after him, but I'm pretty sure I can think of plenty of older films that do a lot of showing, not telling. I'm pretty sure that goes back to, you know, stage direction, never mind film direction. I could be wrong about that, though. And I don't want to dismiss his accomplishments here, because there's a lot of showing, not telling. There's so much of it, in fact, I'm not even going to tell you at all. What I am going to do is convey a lot of the intro stuff. So first thing we see is the cosmic concept, the one constant throughout the course of the thing. Probably actually based on Zoroastrianism, but... I wasn't able to actually confirm that, but the parallels are pretty stark. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that was a deliberate thing. I mean, this is Kubrick we're talking about here. 
<sighs> but um, the ideas of the light, the dark, and the contrast thereof, and the light coming out of the dark, and blah, 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 is is a recurring motif that we will see, I believe, four times throughout the course of this film, each time at a momentous p- point. The beginning, a shift point, a shift point, and then the, the terminus. Now, so first we see the cosmic concept. The next thing we see is a very personal concept. The the apes just kind of eating, you know, foraging, trying to find whatever. Then we see death. The leopard attacks them. Then we see conflict. Now, the conflict part's interesting because you notice they don't kill each other. You caught that, right? That's a nice little touch. Because all they do is yell and rant and screech, go over there, go over there. In order to get what they want, they screech and rail and flail their arms at each other until finally they push the other tribe out of the water, which also establishes the core concept of what I usually refer to as tribe mentality or line mentality. Um, Of course... Then they encounter the PlayStation 3, I mean, the, the monolith. And in so seeing it, they start to be like, huh, okay, that's pretty weird. Then we move forward a little bit, and there's this very, very slow but steady realization of a concept. Now, this is all going to sound very basic, and please forgive me. I'm sure a thousand other people have said this. How many essays have been done on this film? You guys asked me to talk about this. What do you want from me? But <laughs> having recently taken care of, I say recently, within the last six years, having taken care of a child, and within the last year, having taken care of an, another new child, there's something interesting about watching a human being develop concepts. It's such a base level thing, the things that you and I would take absolutely for granted, but that they haven't had a chance to learn yet, right? That's why we're here, to help them to, to help them learn, to help pass on what we have already learned onto them so they could learn quicker and be smarter and have better lives and, and do something other than make YouTube videos. <clears throat> but the way that Daniel Richter, I wrote down his name, goes through the portrayal of seeing the series of bones and realizing that the bones strike each other and then noticing the reaction of the strike and then deliberately striking and then striking in a different way and then striking in a way that breaks it's just you can see the the it's not even a light bulb it's like the lamp is slowly being the candle is slowly being lit or something i don't know as it slowly dawns on this creature a concept a very, very, very base level concept that you and I take so for granted, I imagine most people don't even cognate it most of the time. The concept of a tool. That is what we are, after all, at our core basics. We are tool users. For, for whatever else you could say about human beings, that's us. I look around my room here, my studio, and I, I'm not even sure how to properly enunciate how... I'd say... 99.9% of what is in this room is a tool. And the things that aren't are inside a tool. I keep water beside me for, for my throat, you know? So the water isn't a tool. The bottle is. And separately, the label is. And separately, the cap is. This is how basic we're talking here. It's fascinating the way he showcases this, though. And then immediately after this, we see both the benefits and detriments of tool use. Or, if you, one might argue, the benefits and other benefits. Because the first benefit we see is all the people of the tribe eating. They have plenty of food now because they can hunt better. With plentiful food comes greater population. And you'll notice the next time there's an encounter, there's more of the ape people involved. And while they're getting after each other, they don't just go... Rah, rah, rah. But they actually decide to fight each other. And using their new tools, which they have now come to understand can be used to kill, they t- they kill, they kill the guy. They actually kill the guy. Now what's funny is they leave it a little bit ambiguous if this was a tribal conflict, if this was a rivalry conflict, if this was a conflict over mating rights, over leadership, over food rights, over water rights. There's all sorts of possibilities there. It doesn't matter because that's not the point. The point is that it is now a tool. And a tool can be used however we choose to use it. A tool is inherently neutral, after all. So, that then leads us into a very long section of spaceflight. 
Now, some of you may have seen my rumination on Star Wars. Star Wars. Wow. Star Trek The Motion Picture. That was a long time ago. And that's actually the last time I saw the film was when I did that rumination. So that's, what, five years ago at this point? Something like that? But I remember saying something in it. I remember saying how I felt that several of the long panning shots of the Enterprise were boring. That there were too much of them, too many of them, and they were too long. In that, I baked in a defense of that because I pointed out this film and its usages of the same general concept in a different way. I stand by that statement having rewatched this because while each of these sequences is very long, the shots that I would feel could be cut safely are actually quite short because each shot isn't just here's the moon craft, here's the moon craft, here's the moon craft, which is what Star Trek The Motion Picture does. You know, replace Mooncraft with Enterprise, and you've basically got it. Now, what this does is, here's the Mooncraft, here's the... uh, I want to say waitress, but that's the wrong word. The flight attendant. Here's the flight attendant. Here's her shoes. Here's the food she's offering. Here's the pen. Here's the man who's fallen asleep. Here's the thing they're going to dock to. This is how they're going to dock with it. This is the process of docking itself. At each step, we're actually being shown something different which is all getting across, again, showing, not telling. It's all making... First of all, it's showing the audience what spaceflight could be like, and a surprisingly realistic take on it, I might add. But more to the point, it is also trying to establish the idea that spaceflight is normalized, at least within close range. The idea that this is basically like an airplane. In fact, you'll notice the airplane aesthetic is all over the place for both of the first two flights. They have flight attendants, they have in-flight movies, they have snacks that come by, which are much better than the snacks we get nowadays. <laughs> um, they, have a, they have an airport, the waiting area with the kind of curved up thing and seats, and there's a little dining area. They've got a telephone booth where you can pay a little money in order to phone home. It's, it's, it's all designed to be the exact same aesthetic as an, air, as an airplane and an airport. Now that's relevant because, well, you or I probably don't fly in airplanes every other day unless you're, you know, if someone who does business trips all the time. I actually know several people like that in my, in my family as well as amongst my friends. But for the most part, most of us probably don't fly around every day. We could. If we're being honest, it's not that expensive to get a plane ticket. Not really. And it's not that hard to get a plane ticket, go to a plane, and take a plane trip. And that's my point. Well, we might not have a huge reason to do so, we have free availability to do so if we wanted to, which is the same implication that is gotten by the film. Then we also see a very interesting scene to me. There's a bit where uh, they're talking with several of the Russians about this. Uh, several points in this film. Um, the language thing, when he gets off the, the moon shuttle, the flags on the side of the ship, and the multinationality in both major meetings showcase the idea that at this point Earth is probably a lot more unified Again, showing, not telling. They never say that. They never say there's a united Earth. There might not be a united Earth. This just might just be, you know, the big eight or whatever nations. But they do get across the idea that this is a unified, more unified effort. That this is kind of a, a UN sort of a thing, if nothing else. Quick aside, by the way. Yes, I've read the book. No, I'm not referencing it. The, the film script had a lot of changes as it was going. Like way into development, and the novel certainly tends to answer some questions, but also significantly rewrites certain points, to the point where I've decided to just kind of ignore it. And we'll talk about 2010 later. So, they're doing all this stuff. The, I mentioned the snack tray. Uh, what does that say? That ah, doesn't matter. The other thing I wanted to mention, though, I know this is going to sound very stupid. There's this light bit where it's like, hey, here's the ten steps you need to know to use a toilet in zero gravity. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the fact that they bothered to, to pause on that has amused me. I also want to mention something that absolutely amused me so much that I want to use this as a concept. Grip shoes. Now, based on how it's shown, they appear to be some kind of Velcro, but 
that makes so much sense. Rather than having magnetic boots or whatever, you just have these grip shoes and you just kind of make sure to take small, careful steps along the Velcro floor or up the Velcro wall or on the Velcro ceiling or whatever because that helps you to stay grounded when you're moving around in zero G or low to zero G. It's, it's just a nice little touch and it, they show the, the grip shoes several times and it was easily my favorite part of the whole bit. So, they did a lot of set work, which I think is one of the reasons that this film works very well. There's actually a surprisingly small amount of special effects, actual special effects. Like I said, I think that's one of the big reasons why it aged so well. Even for the moon things, they actually came, they brought in sand, which was then painted in order to showcase it as if it was moon dust, which, funnily enough, isn't actually how moon dust works, but that's okay. Because that's not the point. The point is it looks like the moon, and they've got a set, and now it looks good, even in 2020, like I mentioned earlier. They also use that same, I hesitate to use this word, music, every time the obelisk shows up. Do you notice that? Probably one of my least favorite parts of the film. <laughs> now, I haven't mentioned this before, but I jotted down a timestamp of 25 minutes and 43 seconds. Why? That's the first time there's any dialogue in this film. I was going to make the comment, can you imagine a modern film having the balls to not have dialogue for 25 minutes and 43 seconds before actually having people talk to each other? And then I remember there's that quiet film where people don't talk to each other. It came out like last year or whatever. I don't even remember the name of it. Hush or something? No, Hush is the Batman thing. <laughs> At the same time, though, I am reminded very strongly of the film's unique approach to things. One of the things I talk about a lot is pacing. And as much as I do praise a lot of elements of this film, I think its pacing is lacking. I think it goes too far out of its way to tell the story in the way... I'm trying to think how to phrase this. In a way that feels more like the story is being told rather than a way that follows good pace with regards to storytelling. I know that sounds strange, but... My point is, if you took an editor to this and had them kind of splice it a little bit, because I'm not a big fan of over-editing either, but a little bit more editing might actually serve the overall tempo of the film. Funny fact, apparently they filmed roughly 200 times more film than actually showed up on camera. Now, I, don't, I don't know if I'd buy that, but I would buy that they did a lot of very, very long shots, and what we're seeing is already chopped down substantially. Anyways... So then we get to the 57 minute and 26, 26 second mark. Why is that substantial? It's the first time we see Hal. Now I started thinking about this. And I'd like to open up the floor, so to speak, to a question. What do you think the main plot of this film is? I know what's most memorable about it because I've paid attention to science fiction and culture for the last 30 years. Hal is usually stated as the plot of this film. For the longest time, I have disagreed with that. I've always thought of Hal as a side plot on the way. Upon rewatch, the Hal section takes up a very large chunk of the film. Uh, I don't remember the exact time. It's roughly an hour of a two and a half hour film. Very large chunk of time. So in terms of sheer, you know, presence and screen presence, you could argue that the Hal AI going nuts thing is definitely the main plot of the film. I still disagree, though. The Hal thing still feels like a side quest on the way. Not that I'm making fun of that, but it's especially weird because of how much it only, in my opinion, only serves one real purpose to the narrative. Obviously, it serves a purpose to the film. It adds danger, danger and tension and makes this something other than an art film. And, of course, it gave us our stamp on memory because... Everyone frickin' knows Hal. As I have mentioned when I was ruminating on The Godfather, it's very hard and very weird to look at something that's been parodied and, com and, and just redone and reanalyzed dozens and dozens of times since the thing and seeing, seeing it being played absolutely straight. Hal is legitimately chilling, and it's hard to accept that given how much it's been parodied. It's like the, again, to parallel it to Godfather, I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse, is actually a very chilling, very horrible scene. Very, very well done, I mean. But very horrible sentiment. Similar problem here. They do establish how very quickly he can think, 
He can deal with chess. He has concerns over the mission. And notice that as he's bringing up his concerns and discussing this, that's when he notices the <clears throat> malfunction. Right. Now, the impression I have always been left with, and I was left with it this time as well, was the fact that Hal <sighs> developed in ways that he wasn't designed to, and that was causing him to literally start making mistakes to misinterpret data or to see things in a wrong way. Now, logically, he would look at that and say, well, I've, there's never been a HAL 9000, you know, there's never been a 9000 series that's screwed up, so obviously it's incredibly logical that the problem is human error. What else could it be? Of course, anyone with a brain could understand why that is a fallacy. If you flip a coin, and it turns up heads, and it turns up heads, and it turns up heads, and you stop and say, well, this coin will always turn up heads, right? It doesn't actually matter how long you do this. This is a logical fallacy, right? And that makes perfect sense for something like Hal to make. You can kind of see how so much of the the, the grandfathering of a lot of, you know, uh, AI gone bad stories kind of pull inspiration from this. What Hal does is also interesting because it's not openly psychotic. It's just... Well, it's kind of like a computer would think. First it tries to get rid of... I still can't remember his name. And then, of course, Bowman goes out to save him. So, okay, that's a convenient way to get rid of Bowman. And then it just shuts off the life support for the people in the pods. There you go. We're done. No problem. It doesn't actually try to do anything else. I mean, why would it bother? There's no real reason to. It only becomes an issue when Bowman comes back with the body and is like, Hey, let me in, Hal. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm afraid I can't let you do that, Dave. And again... It's hard to listen to that and not laugh just out of habit because of how often that's parodied. But again, here it is chilling. He is outside in a pod, outside of his spaceship in the middle of absolutely nowhere. And his the thing that controls his spaceship will not let him in. The actor who plays Bowman does a good job of portraying the... like the, the slow descent as he's just starting to breathe... A little bit more and trying to get his breath. You know, he, he portrays the panic that he is clearly muscling down very well. Again, a lot of showing, not telling. I also want to mention something interesting. Earlier when they're discussing the pod, they don't actually want to disconnect Hal, which I find fascinating. I, I don't know if that's because of fondness or because of simple machinery problems, but they don't actually want to. They just presume if he has a problem, then we have to disconnect him from the computer. And they're right. If he is making this kind of a flaw, he could do something like, I don't know, screw up the air filtration fil or, or the, the artificial gravity generation or whatever, and then, they, and then it's all over, right? So it makes a lot of sense that they're like, okay, we have to do this, I guess. All right, well, let's go check on it and see what happens. One of the other things this film does very well is it, it has very precise usage of silence. Two of my favorite scenes uh, that use the silence. First is when, I can't remember his name, is killed. The, the pod turns around, grabs him, and flings him off. And that's that's the end of him. He, he is dead pretty much as of that moment. I find it interesting how they try to rip him apart, but not only would that probably have been impossible with the effects of the time, but again, remember, Hal isn't really being openly psychotic. Hal is removing... A, a, Hal's a cleaning robot. And there's this broken down bit of straw, you know, like the wrapper around a straw, and it's just sitting on the desk. So he's just like, all right, let's just move this out of the way. There we go. Oh, and now something, now there's a toothpick. All right, hang on. Okay. And someone walks down and says, can I sit here? No. No, this is clean. It needs to stay clean. Well, but then I can't use it. It needs to be clean. You can kind of see the parallel. It also ties back into the theme of the club all the way back at the beginning. Hal is a tool. I, I've argued for years about the nature of AI versus VI and the nature of droid effect. It is my opinion firmly that Hal does not have droid effect happening upon it. That Hal is in fact simply an advanced VI, which is developing in ways that it was not allowed to, and that is actually causing malfunctions. That is not sentience and sapience. That's a broken program. That is my opinion. And I expect many people to disagree with me. And that's cool. I would, as ever, love to know your guys' thoughts on the matter. 
But I bring that up because, again, no matter how you think of it, HAL is a tool. What HAL is used for, well, that's up to the ones using him, or it, I suppose. So, looking at my notes here. Ah, yes, the second really silent scene, which I very much enjoyed. It's the scene where Bowman gets back on board the ship, right before he goes to disconnect HAL, which I didn't even realize was actually the climax of the film, or at least the climax of that particular side quest. It's not the climax of the film. There's like 40 minutes after that point. No. But the way he's blown on board, and, just, and you just see him smash in, in total silence, with no sound whatsoever, until the air starts coming in. That was effective as hell. And it really adds a very creepy tariff terror vibe underneath everything else that's going on. So, <laughs> how... What happens next is, again, a scene that's been parodied many times. I know I've said that a lot. Hal starts getting disconnected. And what happens is actually very chilling and arguably sad. Hal emotionlessly, calmly, patiently begs for its life. It's okay. I have had some issues, but I have fixed them. I am ready to move forward with enthusiasm. There is no need for any future injunctions and just the way he says it is is wonderfully chilling i also kind of like how despite the fact that hal controls the ship it's actually relatively easy for him to shut hal down once he is inside said ship too often science fiction tends to portray you know ai or person or whatever that controls a ship controls everything perfectly and infinitely sometimes to actually ludicrous degrees i'm looking at you cyborg so Hal dies. Mission control then fires up the second Hal goes down and tells him the actual mission that he is, which at this point he's the only one left, and well, it's not like he's got a lot else going on in his day, so he might as well go ahead and finish it. Yeah, why not? So then he goes out, sees the monolith, and then... Well, then Bowman goes to Plaid. <laughs> I know that there was originally going to be aliens in this film. I want you to remember that, because it's going to come up in a minute. We also see the the light, the dark, you know, the, the Zoroastrian thing coming in again with the with the nature of how they present it, and then and then he's in a room, and then he's a baby in orbit of Earth. The end. I kind of skipped over the fact that he turned into an old man and had a treat and very baroque room. Okay. I believe I prefaced this. I'm not actually sure because I'm, I'm trying to keep in mind a lot of things here. But I believe I prefaced this with the idea that the core mentality behind doing these films, the, these ruminations, excuse me, is always, I just finished playing the game or watching the show or watching the film. And then when I sit down to record, my mindset is, okay, there's my buddy or buddies or friends or whoever. And they just watched the show, watched the film, played the game. And so we're talking. All the stuff I write down is all the stuff that occurs to me that I feel is interesting or worthy of note. That's that's my process. Obviously, I do try to be a little more analytical with analysis mode on like the whole time, but that is the overall mentality. Now, I bring that up because I don't have to pretend that with this film. Uh, just about four years ago, I, w I sat down and actually watched this film with a friend of mine, and we actually had a discussion about the film immediately after that in the exact same format I just mentioned. The problem is the discussion went like, okay, so, yeah, that was cool, and the thing, and I could see why Hal, and it discuss, 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 discuss. So what do you think of the ending? And then we made fun of it for about ten minutes solid. See, here's the problem. If you actually ask me, the, 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 the human being, what I think of the ending, I just start laughing. Because it's ludicrous nonsense. Because he goes to plaid, and then ends up in a room, and then ends up old, and then ends up, ends up a baby who is in orbit of Earth. What? Okay, and at about at that point, my brain's just like, nope, I'm out. Peace! Because I just don't have anything to say about that, because it's just insane. And I can just wait. I, I'm just picturing people who are going to be like, you're just missing the symbolism of all this. And that's entirely possible. It's very valid that I am just straight up missing whatever they're going for here. But when I look at that, I just my brain just shuts it. I had the same problem this time. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. This is my job. 
and I am a professional, and I'm going to do the damnedest I can to come up with something to talk about for this ending, other than it be weird, yo. <sighs> See, the thing is, the only thing I came up with still doesn't really apply. Here's what I came up with. So, the monolith itself serves as a gateway to... Uh, Let's call it a energy dimension, a slightly variant dimension on the existing ones, wherein a comfortable, familiar surrounding has been prepared for Bowman as the first human being to actually reach out and reach this stage of progression by the aliens who put the monolith on Earth to begin with and have been following its progress this whole time. They have done this as a deliberate effort to uplift one of the primitive races they saw on Earth that they felt had some kind of you know, potential for eventual development. They then reach out to him, greet him, uh, welcome him, accept him, blah, blah, blah. And uh, after he trips out for a while, the one thing I can't really explain is the child over the earth. That's just weird. Like, the rest of it, I can kind of be like, yeah, okay. I got nothing. I got nothing for the, for the baby staring over earth thing. <sighs> uh, thematic significance of innocence, viewing the place of birth. Um... Inverse of the usual womb mentality. How about it's not actually him, it's actually what the aliens are taking the form of as they are observing Earth. I don't know. You could also argue that it's basing a human being down to its most basic level. The level where understanding that a bone can be used as a tool, and thus the very concept of tools being a unique idea to this thing, could be the idea. It ends where it begins, in other words. I mentioned earlier that this film was deliberately designed to make more questions than answers. This is very apparent at the ending, which then, of course, leads very naturally into the novelization and 2010. Yes, I am aware of 2010, in case I haven't said that already. Yes, I know exactly where it goes with the story. Um, let's just Let's just move on. Now, here's the final bombshell, and I decided to say this for last, because it is in my best interest to make sure that you don't stop hitting you know, play the moment the video starts. I don't actually like this film all that much. I don't. This is probably the fifth time I've seen this film overall. First was when I was very young. Obviously, one of the earliest sci-fi films I watched, along with THX, I forget the number. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, this, uh, I don't like it. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, you're just a moron. Possibly. Possibly. It is very, very possible that I am just too stupid to actually understand or appreciate this film. The problem is, I do appreciate this film. A lot. This film is a technical masterpiece. The amount of stuff that this film did, again, as I already iterated at the beginning, about uh, developing filmmaking as a concept, developing effects, uh, pushing the ideas of what they could do with spaceflight or how to use... Uh, certain types of uh, plastic screen, or how they could use set design in order to work their way around the problems of typical special effects and using matte paintings and all this stuff. <sighs> Actually, the matte paintings is a bad example because I know they did that before this film. But the point being, this film did a lot of things to push cinematography forward. If I was to use a parallel, this is probably going to out me as a geek. Sorry, guys. I would compare it to Legend of Zelda 1, the original on the NES. It is very innovative, very remarkable, and should be applauded for all of its achievements and for all the things that it did. That doesn't mean I enjoy it. If I was to try and put a finger on why I don't enjoy it, I would say it is the ending. The intro? Cool. The spaceflight thing? Love that. It's actually probably my favorite part of the film. Is the, you know, the 20 minutes, it, that's an exaggeration, it's probably close to 15 minutes of early spaceflight from, you know, when they first head out to the airport and then from the airport to the moon. I actually unironically love that section. And then we have, you know, the actual mission starts, which is okay. Then we have the HAL section. Now, this is going to sound very strange, but I actually find the HAL section to be by far the least, second least interesting part of the film. Ultimately, because it feels like a misstep in the otherwise narrative about larger thematic points. Uh, don't mistake me, I think the need for a personal story was very necessary, but there's a lot of ways you could have gone that without involving a 
a robot slash AI trying to kill everyone. <sighs> I know, the one thing I don't like is the most iconic part of the film. Go ahead, make fun, it's okay. But, of course, that's not quite true, because even the HAL stuff, if that was basically the end, it's like, okay, I'm going to complete the mission. The end. Sure, I'm with it. No, instead, he decides to go to Plaid. And that is when I officially am lost in the film. Everything up until that point, I can either stomach or enjoy. But the moment the ending starts, which, oh, I should have written it down, it is a long ending from when he first interacts with the obelisk until the final shot over Earth. It is a huge chunk of time. And I don't mind the film taking its time. What I mind is the ending. And I'm saying this to emphasize that the ending is not a small part of the film. It is a huge part of the film. And... Uh, as I said earlier, I just kind of like, okay, with regards to the whole thing. I'm going to go ahead and admit something here. I've mentioned I've seen this film five times. I've only seen it all the way through three times. The first time, the time with my friend I mentioned earlier, and this time. The two intervening times, I, as soon as the, the message plays and he starts going on, I just hit stop and stop watching the film at that point. Now, I am exceptionally interested to know your guys' thoughts, for those of you who have cared to watch this far. I want to know what your thoughts about the uh, directorial approach, the establishment of scenes, the minimalist use of dialogue... There's actually very, very little dialogue in this film overall, which I, I'm with. I like it. I like the approach to it. And I would love to know what the heck you make of that ending. Ignoring 2010. If you just want to accept 2010 as canon, that's fine. Sure. You know, more power to you. But if you were to eject 2010 from existence, what do you think of that ending? What do you think the original intent was? Because, well, I mean, because I guess they did a lot of drugs back in that day? I don't know. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed my incredibly amateurish thoughts. I'll see you next time, guys.